This morning, I want to give you just a couple of uh, hypothetical situations for you to think about. And in your own mind, I'd like for you to think how you would uh, respond in these situations. First, imagine that you are a Christian who's chosen not to drink alcohol. Uh, Now you understand that it's not forbidden to uh, have a social drink according to the Scriptures. And you're not an alcoholic, uh, you're not, uh, have an inclination towards that, you're not underage, there's none of those other reasons, you just simply have decided that between you and the Lord that this is not something that you necessarily need to be involved in, and you've simply made a decision, why, why drink? Well, imagine that you have some new neighbors that move into your neighborhood, and you're quite convinced that these new neighbors are not Christians. And so you invite them over uh, to come for dinner. And they show up for dinner, and imagine, uh, surprise, surprise, they brought a hostess gift uh, with them, and that hostess gift is a bottle of wine. And imagine that your new neighbor says to you, uh, explains that he is a, works for a wine distributor, and this is a very uh, excellent bottle of wine, and he's been saving it for a very special occasion. And he thought that to get to meet new neighbors, uh, to set it off on the right foot, uh, he would bring uh, this bottle of wine. So he asks for a corkscrew, he opens up the bottle of wine and uh, says, would you like to join him uh, in a glass? Now, do you A, politely decline, or B, allow him to pour you a glass, take a few sips, and compliment him uh, on his choice? Think about that, what you would do for a moment. Second situation, imagine that your traditional Sunday attire is business casual, khakis and a button-down shirt. But imagine this Sunday, you've been asked to go and lead a Bible study at a retirement home. And uh, while the retirement home is mostly made up of Christians, there are definitely some non-Christians there. And given that culture, even the non-Christians come to that Bible study on Sunday evening, and they consider that their church. They're not able to get out. And uh, as a result, they get dressed up, even the non-Christians, in their Sunday best. Uh, Suit and tie, whole deal. Uh, and this is very important for them. Now, imagine that you uh, look in your closet and you remember that you've got that suit that your mom bought for you for your first job interview uh, five or six years ago. And uh, although you hate it and you've never worn it since, not comfortable, it still actually fits. So question, do you go to that retirement home to lead that Bible study in your usual business casual dress? Or Do you dust off the suit and wear that instead? Think about what you would do in that situation. Third situation, you've been called by God to lead a small group of uh, high school girls. You're asked to be the leader of that group, and uh, it's going pretty well. The girls are connecting to you, and then one day a new girl joins the group, and it's pretty clear that she's not a Christian. Now, you've tried your best, but you're not able really to connect with her. When you and uh, she have conversations, they tend to be surface uh, and, and shallow, and you just don't seem to ha- you have much to talk about. And you also notice that this new non-Christian girl, she for the most part feels like she's on the outside because uh, everybody else has a Christian heritage in common, but you do notice there's one thing that she really engages with when it's the topic of conversation, and that is when people are talking about the Twilight series, the series of Uh, fiction books and movies, and she's very into those. Uh, She's read all the books. She's waited in line to see the movies. She's got her opinions uh, on uh, which person uh, she is more sort of associated with. And now imagine that she comes and she says to you, I ask you, have you ever read any of the books in the Twilight series? And you've never told the group this, but you hate that kind of fiction, and you're, you're quite aware you would not, you would not enjoy that book. But all you simply tell her is, no, 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 I've not read those. Then she offers uh, to let you borrow her copy. Do you accept the copy and uh, choose to read it and look forward to interacting with her in a few weeks' time, or do you politely decline? Think about that for a minute. Well, in each of those situations, our first inclination might be, well, we're free to do whatever we want. Isn't that why uh, one of the great things about being Christians is that Christ has set us free? We're not obligated to do one thing or another. We're free to make whatever decision we want to make. 
But I'd like to suggest to us this morning that that's not actually the case. If you have your Bible, would you turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This year, that's page, sorry, 811, if you're using one of the Bibles the church provides. This year we've been studying the book of 1 Corinthians, trying to determine uh, how Jesus would think and act and live in certain situations. And this morning we have an opportunity to think about how someone who has the mind of Christ would approach those hypothetical scenarios. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now let me set the context for us. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul was talking about uh, eating meat sacrificed to idols. And two weeks ago, Tom Olson, our associate pastor, led us through that passage in a very excellent way and helped us to realize that there are certain situations in which we must not choose to do things because they could harm a weaker brother. They could cause a weaker brother to stumble. They might destroy that other Christian. Well, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul expands on that idea. And now instead of talking about Christians, Paul begins to talk to us about things that we either should do or should not do so that we might reach non-Christians for Christ. Now he begins in verse number 1, thinking about the issue of rights and freedoms. He says in verse 1, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? This case is quite simple. He's saying, look, truth be told, I'm an apostle. I've seen the risen Christ. And the church in Corinth, you are a result of my labor in the Lord. So if anybody's going to have rights and privileges and authorities and freedoms, you would think it was Paul. I mean, he's pretty high up the chain. Just under Christ come the apostles. He's got lots of authority and therefore lots of freedom. So he gives us some examples of areas in which he has freedom. Look in verse 4. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Aren't we free to eat or not eat, free to drink or not drink, free to get married or not get married? And then in verse 6, he gives another area in which he has rights and freedoms. And this is an area he spends a little more time on. He says, verse 6, Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? And here he wants to say, look, we also have another right. And the right is to get paid for our labor. Yeah, can I get an amen for that? <laughs> because it's so important to pay the ministers for their labor, we're going to spend some time <laughs> looking at this. He wants to establish that he definitely has this right, and so he begins first by using arguments of logic. Look in verse 7. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Things around us, logic itself tells us that somebody who labors for the kingdom ought to be financially remunerated for that. They ought to be paid for that. I mean, nobody is a soldier and then has to pay their own way, and no farmer refuses to eat of any of the harvest I mean, that's part of what it means to labor. Well, that's where he starts his case, but he keeps escalating it. In verse 8, do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? So not only does logic tell you that he as an apostle should be paid for his work, the Old Testament says it. Verse 9, for it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? Not only does logic say that Paul should get paid, the law says that Paul should get paid. Now, he goes on to establish this right even greater. 
in verse 13 and 14, don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, look at this, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Not only does logic and the law demand it, but the Lord himself. I mean, you couldn't have a right or a privilege or a freedom more firmly established than this. Paul's an apostle. He's got authority. Logic tells you the law affirms it and Christ commands it. In every case, he should get paid for his work. But look in verse 15. But I've not used any of these rights. He came and ministered among the Corinthians and did not take any of their money. He chose to forego his rights and his privileges and his freedom because he thought it would better allow him to share the gospel with them. And here's where we find that there is a greater law at work than our freedom and our rights and our privileges. And that law is spelled out in verses 19 to 23, and this is really where we want to spend our time this morning. Paul says, though I am free, free to eat or not eat, free to drink or not drink, free to get married or not get married, free to get paid or not get paid, and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not actually under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. And here is the greater principle that's at work, not our freedoms and our rights, but the responsibility that we have to love others and become like them so that we might share the gospel with them. Now, how did Paul do this? Well, he gives us a couple of examples. He says here, to the Jews and those under the law, under the Mosaic law, I became like one under the law. Even though as a Christian, Paul was free from the Mosaic law, he actually put himself back under the Mosaic law so that he might win Jewish people. Now, what does that look like? Let me show you that in a very striking way. Turn over, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's page 822, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, I'd read this verse in this passage hundreds of times in my life, and only this week as I began studying 1 Corinthians 9 did I understand the startling nature of what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 24. In this passage, Paul's giving a list of the different kinds of suffering he's gone through for the sake of the gospel. And in the middle of that list, when he talks about shipwrecks and he talks about uh, all the things that he has suffered and gone through, he says in verse 24, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Now, truth be told, in the hundreds of other times I've read through this passage in my life, I just sort of glanced over that. That's just one of the list. Uh, one of the things in the list that he went through. But when you stop to think about it for a moment, we have to remember that the Jewish people do not run the ancient world. At this time, it's the Romans who run the ancient world, and those who are Jews are not free to go around flogging or whipping whoever they feel like doing that to. Now, the Romans could, but not the Jews. However, the Romans had ceded to the Jewish nation the right to discipline anybody who self-identified with that nation. So anybody who was willing to say, yes, I'm part of the Jewish people and I'm under the authority of the synagogue, they had a right to punish. 
Now here's the amazing thing. Paul's a Roman citizen. Nobody can flog him without him willingly putting himself under their authority. The Jews don't have a right to do that. But what this tells me is, is that five times Paul went into the synagogue and he proclaimed Jesus Christ as Messiah and was convicted of blasphemy. And instead of resigning his membership in the synagogue, he chose instead to allow them to give him the harshest punishment possible, which was 39 lashes. Five different times. Now, why not just resign your membership? Why not just say, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't touch me. I'm done with all of this. Why not just quit going to the synagogue? Why not just say, look, I don't want to be part of this. I have Christ now. I'm not under your law. I'm under the law of Christ. It's because he wanted to reach the Jewish people for Christ. And if he disassociated himself from the synagogue, he would be disassociating himself from those people. And so although he was free not to be whipped, he chose to give up that freedom and submit himself to this kind of corporal punishment so that he might continue to try to win Jews to Christ. That's what he means back in 1 Corinthians 9 when he says, to the Jews I became like a Jew and to those under the law I became like one under the law. He didn't use his freedom to avoid floggings. Instead, he made himself a slave to the synagogue and endured punishment. He also says, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. What he means is, is that to Gentiles, he became like a Gentile. When he was ministering to Gentiles, Paul, who was Jewish, who grew up with a Jewish heritage, who had an appreciation for Jewish culture, who liked Jewish food, who celebrated Jewish holidays, who had that Jewish sense of superiority that came at this time, Paul, who was in every way a Jew, chose not to participate in those things when he went to hang out with Gentiles. It would be sort of like if you uh, are an American citizen here today and you've grown up in America, and you've gotten used to American ways of doing things, and you like American food and American holidays and American culture and American ways of, of approaching life, and suddenly you move to another country, and you find that in that country they don't celebrate Thanksgiving, and there's no parades on the 4th of July, and there's no macaroni and cheese, and there's no pizza, and there's no opportunity for you to sing the national anthem in public. And there are not people who think like Americans. And there's not appreciation for American heritage and American culture. Well, that's what Paul willingly went through whenever he was with Gentiles. He let go of his heritage, his culture, his food, his celebrations. Why? Because he didn't like them anymore? No, because he wanted to reach Gentiles for Christ. And when he wanted to reach Gentiles for Christ, his own freedom to enjoy celebrations and kosher food and Jewish superiority was uh, getting in the way of him being able to share the gospel with Gentiles. He also says, verse 22, to the weak I became weak. Now, he doesn't mean to weak Christians. That's what he was talking about in 1 Corinthians 8. Here he's talking about to those who are weak non-Christians, meaning those who are socially marginalized, the repressed of society, to slaves, to those who are lower down the social chain. It means that when he interacted with them, he didn't make use of his Roman citizenship. He didn't make use of his upper social uh, class training and education. Instead, when he was with those who were slaves, he acted like a slave and he had all of the rights of those who were slaves. Why did he do this? He says in the end of verse 22, I have become all things to all men, so that by all means possible, I might save some. You see, he didn't come holding on to his rights and privileges to do certain things or to not do certain things. There was a principle that overrode that. And the principle was, is there are people out there who need Jesus Christ. And my rights and my privileges and my preferences and the things that I enjoy can become a stumbling block or a hindrance to them hearing the gospel. That's the attitude that we're to have as well. 
as you think through those scenarios at the beginning of the sermon, as you think through other ways in which this makes itself out, that's the attitude is that I become all things to all men so that by all possible means we might win some to Christ. Let me give us five observations that will help as we try to think through applying this principle in our lives today. First, I want to say up front, this is an easy principle to abuse. It's very easy to say that you and I are doing the things that we're doing because we want to win people to Christ, when in reality, it's just simply a cover for the things we want to do. Paul did what he did because he wanted to win people to Christ. You and I may say, look, I'd like to live in a ritzy neighborhood, and hey, those people need Christ, so maybe I should move into their ritzy neighborhood. Well, that's fine if you're going to actually share the gospel with the people in your neighborhood. But if you're just using it as a cover to live where you want to live and do where you, what you and I want to do, that's an abuse of this principle. If instead, for example, we decide that God has called us to minister among the poor, and so we look at our fancy car and we decide that we'd be better off trading down so that the vehicle we show up in is not a stumbling block to those who do not yet know Christ. That's what Paul's talking about here. So the litmus test as to whether you and I are abusing this principle or not is, are we sharing Christ? If you've moved into a ritzy neighborhood and you're sharing Christ with the people around you, that's what he's talking about. And if you've traded down uh, to go and minister among the poor and you're sharing the gospel with the poor, you're doing what he's talking about. He says, I become all things to all men so that I might win some to Christ. That's the purpose. It's not a cover for the things we want to do. Second observation is, is that I think to put this principle into practice today is not easy. I said earlier that Paul, when he was with the Gentiles, he abandoned his Jewish heritage. It wasn't because he hated being a Jew. He liked those holidays. He liked that food. He liked that attitude. He liked the Jewish way of thinking. That's all he knew. That's what he grew up with. It was not easy for him to let go of those things. I had a friend in seminary. He and I were uh, close friends, and we would hang out together. Both of us were late-night people, and so that's partly why I think we uh, naturally uh, bonded with one another because we would often spend uh, uh, time into the wee hours of the morning uh, watching movies or hanging out and talking and doing those things. And I remember he came to me one day and said that there was a neighbor at his apartment complex that he was wanting to lead to Christ. Uh, and I said, well, that's great. How, how are you going to go about doing it? He's like, well, the problem is the guy's a runner. Now, neither my friend or I would ever lace up shoes to go running for any, except if we were being chased. Uh, there was no other reason <laughs> to run. And I was like, oh, what are you going to do about that? He's like, oh, the other problem is he likes to go running at six in the morning. I was like, well, I hope you find something else you can use to share the gospel with him. But you know what my friend did is, is he got up and went running. And that was not easy. I remember the first week I saw him after he started, he looked like he had died. I mean, he was really walking around like a dead man because he never told uh, his neighbor that he didn't run because he wanted to use this as an opportunity. So the first day they went out and ran five miles. My friend said I couldn't breathe, let alone share the gospel with him. But you know what he did? He continued to go running. And over time, he led his neighbor to Christ. Amen. It's not easy. But when you make those kind of sacrificial efforts, someone, people are drawn to the one who made the ultimate sacrificial effort. Third observation is, is I want to make sure that I'm very clear about this, that what Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians 9 only applies to areas that are morally neutral, Okay? You can't come with an argument and say, well, God wants me to reach those who are uh, sexually active outside of marriage, so I need to be sexually active outside of marriage. That's not what he's talking about here. If you're a student here and you think that God wants you to reach those who are popular in your school, that, that may be well and good, but he doesn't want you to do it by bullying those who are unpopular. And he doesn't want you to win their favor by disobeying your parents. Those things are morally wrong. So we're only talking about areas that are morally neutral. And a better example might be is if you look around your school and maybe you're an athlete and you think, you know what? There's a whole group of people who love theater who don't know Jesus and no one is reaching them for Christ. And so instead of taking advantage of your right and your privilege to play sports, you may say that you're going to give up that right. And the next time there is a play or a musical, see if you can find some part 
that would allow you to be involved with that so that you might reach that community for Christ. That's what Paul's talking about here in, in 1 Corinthians 9. Fourth observation for us to keep in mind as we think about this principle. You hear today a lot about the issue of authenticity. That's sort of a buzzword that people throw around. It's a good word when it means uh, the opposite of hypocrisy. So hypocrisy is to live one way, to say one thing and live some other way. Authenticity is to live in accordance with what you're saying. That's good. But there is a side to the concept of authenticity, which is simply a cover for selfishness. It's when we say, well, that's not who I am, so I'm not going to involve myself in that. But you know, at the end of the day, what Paul's saying here is who you and I are is not nearly as important as the people who don't know Christ need us to be. Imagine that you're a vegetarian and you've chosen to be a vegetarian perhaps because it's a hip thing to do or because you don't like the taste of meat. But imagine that a non-Christian invites you over to their house and they don't know that you're a vegetarian and they've gone to great lengths to prepare a nice juicy steak for you. The authentic thing to do is to turn it down. That's not who you are. You are a vegetarian. But the Christian thing to do is to say that person needs Christ more than I need this freedom and this right. And it's to try to eat it. Fifth, and finally, when you and I take this approach to life of trying to be all things to all men, to win some to Christ, when we do this, we will face opposition, both from non-Christians and from Christians. Paul's having to write 1 Corinthians 9 because there was a group of people in the church at Corinth saying, Paul must not be very much of an apostle if we don't have to pay him. I mean, hey, you get what you pay for. He's free. He must not be any good. And so they begin to rag on him and to harp on him for not accepting money. This happens in other situations, too. There's a man named Hudson Taylor who was uh, one of the first Protestant missionaries uh, in, the, in the country of China to actually engage in dressing in Chinese clothes and grew his hair out long and tried to look uh, like a, 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 a native of China. He's the founder of China Inland Mission, but at the time when he was doing this, nobody was doing these kinds of things. And uh, there is a quote from a book called The B British in the Far East, written by George Woodcock at that time, which sort of gives you how people reacted to Hudson Taylor's efforts to dress like those who lived in China. This author says, a belief in the equality of all men before God, too literally acted upon, can produce patterns of behavior which no imperial society can accept with equanimity to the Taipans, Western business owners in China, and all the other people who believed that the white man's dignity rested in strict adherence to British dress and British habits, Hudson Taylor's actions was deeply, action was deeply shocking. He had gone native. He had lost face. He had broken the magic ring of white solidarity. The word traitor was not too harsh to describe him. Now, those are 19th century British attitudes towards colonialism and imperialism. Those attitudes don't exist to the same extent today. But if you and I want to live this principle out, we will be opposed. There will be people think that we have sold out that we have abandoned our culture, that we're not being true to ourselves. But what Paul is saying is, is that if you and I consider others' needs more important than our own, if we willingly give up our freedoms and our rights and our privileges and we do things that we might not have normally done or we don't do things that we have every right to do, we'll actually be like Christ. Because isn't that what Jesus did? He had the right to stay in heaven. <laughs> he had the freedom to renounce and avoid suffering. Just like the Romans and just like the Jews didn't have any right to whip Paul, humans didn't have any right to crucify Jesus. But he didn't hold on to his rights. And he didn't hold on to his freedoms. Instead, it says he made himself like us in every possible way except sin. And now he sends us to Jews, Gentiles, weak, strong, whoever, and asks us, to become like them in every way possible except sin so that we might win them to Christ. Amen. Because when you and I choose their interests above ours, 
we're proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ who did that for our sake.